Chapter Twenty of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty: The Cat's Paw. It was black with a blackness that seemed to possess tangible substance, as though it wrapped itself around and enveloped the body with a pall whose very texture could be felt. It was unknown ground, and the foot reached out uncertainly, wary of where next it might find lodgment, and the hands stretched out as a blind man's hands stretch out, feeling for hidden things through space. It was dank and musty and in the nostrils was an earthy, cavernous smell, and there was a silence that seemed guarded by the very bowels of the earth itself. And in the silence and the darkness peril lurked, a peril that merged courage with foolhardiness for one who would invite it, and set the nerves on edge, and kept the muscles taut like tight-strung bowstrings, and stimulated the senses into abnormal activity until the eyes peopled the darkness with phantoms that were not there, and the ears created sounds that did not exist. Billy Kane's face under the mask was drawn in hard, strained lines. He raised his right hand that gripped his automatic and drew the back of his hand across his forehead. Foolhardiness! Yes, that was it. He was a fool to come here to take the risk. He knew Wong Yen's by reputation as one of the most infamous Chinese underground dives in the Bad Lands. He remembered it concretely from the incident a few nights ago, when Laverto had had young Clancy drugged here. Was that only a few nights ago? He shook his head. Since those few nights ago he no longer measured the passing of time by normal standards. He had lived all his life since those few nights ago. He moved forward through the blackness, cautiously, silently. Where was the next wall? Or was there any wall at all? His hands, reaching out as far as they could stretch, touched nothing. This was below the ordinary cellar level. It was a sub-cellar, a chain of sub-cellars. How many men had entered here, yes, and women, too, and disappeared? A murder hole. And up above him somewhere was New York. Millions of people, taxicabs, crowded sidewalks, theaters, yes, churches, places where people worshipped. Incredible. He had heard of places like this, and so had the public, and the public smiled in self-sufficient, tolerant amusement. Well, why not? When even the police were ignorant. Everybody admitted that the Chinese quarter was full of ridiculously imitated catacombs, perhaps, but what did it matter if in a block of houses the inmates burrowed from cellar to cellar like rats, and built mysterious doors and passageways, and threw about uh, everything the disguise of wicked and shuddering things, when it was only disguise? It was good for business. The gape-wagons and the slumming conductors profited, and so did the celestials and the slummers, satiated with thrills, the women drawing their skirts closely around their silk-clad ankles, the men surreptitiously feeling in their pockets to assure themselves that their watches and valuables were still in their possession, got their money's worth. Everybody was satisfied, and the public smiled. Billy Kane's fingers tightened on the butt of his automatic. Back somewhere behind him in the darkness a Chinaman still guarded a door that neither slummer nor police had ever entered. But the guard was a gagged and huddled thing on the floor now, still senseless probably from the blow on the head from this same pistol butt. There, there had been no other way. The man was not far behind, just at the entrance, so skillfully disguised by an ordinary coal bin. Was there still another guard in front of him, more than one? If he only dared to use his flashlight for a second— a fool to come here, where, if caught, he would not have a chance of escape, was he? Well, perhaps. Only there was a man's life at stake. Perhaps it was already too late. Red Vallon had said, though, that there wasn't any hurry about bumping off the wop, that they had him safe in here, with his bean tapped to keep him quiet until they finished the rest of the game. It was less than an hour ago that Red Vallon had said that, and it was only eight o'clock now, and the rest of the game, to give it every chance of success, would not be played out for still another hour yet. 
not before old Barloff had closed up for the night. He wasn't too late. He couldn't be too late. There was a man's life at stake. Only an ex-convict, a man out from Sing Sing but a few hours ago, just a prison bird. But the Wop was innocent this time, and... Was that a sound there from somewhere in front of him? Billy Kane stood still. Nothing. No. A dozen sounds that were not really sounds at all. His ears were full of uncanny noises. The back cellar entrance beneath a Chinese tea shop, and after that the rear of the coal bin. Billy Kane was laughing to himself, but the laugh was void of mirth. There was a grim, horrible sort of irony about it all. Believing him, Billy Kane, to be the rat, Red Vallon had reported the accomplishment of the first stage in the execution of the plan with gusto. After that, deft questioning had elicited from the gangster the secret of this entrance to Wong Yen's, and then luck, and then the guard taken unawares. The guard could hardly be blamed. The guard, naturally enough, had little reason to suspect the approach to that coal bin of any one who had not the open sesame to what was beyond, and he had been lurking there where the boards of the bin ingeniously slid apart, and had shown not the slightest uneasiness at his, Billy Kane's, presence, until it was too late. Then there had been a steep, narrow passage downward, and then this— Beyond, near or far, he did not know which, these subcellars hid the real thing that the so-called underground Chinatown above counterfeited, hid debauchery and vice and cradled crime, and here the poppy reigned and the dregs of humanity skulked fearful of the sunlight. They had flung the wop into a corner and left him until they got around to finishing the job, Red Vallon had explained callously. The WAP, therefore, must be somewhere near at hand. But he, Billy Kane, could see nothing, hear nothing, feel nothing. His physical faculties strained and alert, subconsciously Billy Kane's mind was milling over that conversation with the gangster of an hour ago, and upon him, in spite of his own present peril, there came a cold and merciless fury. It was more tonight than the ordinary moral obligation— more than the mere responsibility to render abortive the crimes that came to his knowledge through his tenure of his role of the rat. That was accentuating him now. It was the callous, damnable brutality of the scheme that, linked with its hellish ingenuity, seemed to outrage every instinct of manhood he possessed, and fired him with an overmastering desire not only to frustrate the crime itself, but to take toll in a personal, physical way, if he could, from those who were enacting it. It was one of those plans, conceived by the rat, that waited patiently for its hour of maturity to arrive, and then was executed and carried through to its fulfillment by the minions of that directorate of crime, of which the rat appeared to be the most versatile and vicious member, but without the rat necessarily taking any further active part in it. And he, Billy Kane, who fate had seen fit to mould with features that were evidently a counterpart of that master rogue's, who was for the moment accepted and obeyed as the rat, and was supposed to be the originator of the plan itself, could not very well ask Red Vallon, for instance, for details. Therefore he did not know all the details. But he knew enough. He had wormed quite a little out of Red Vallon without the gangster suspecting anything more than that he, Billy Kane, as the rat, was taking particular pains to see that the stage was properly set and that the possibility of failure was reduced to its absolute minimum. It was very simple. It required simply a man's life, the murder of the Wop. He knew something of the Wop, for the Wop's story was common property, the Wop, in the old days, five years ago, before he had gone up the river for a job in the line, which was his particular specialty, was known both as a tough customer and as one of the cleverest box workers in the safe-cracking profession. The testimony of one Ivan Barloff had been mainly responsible for the WAP's capture and conviction, and the WAP had travelled to Sing Sing with a thirst for vengeance gnawing at his soul, and with the threat quivering on his twisted lips that he would get even with the other when he got out again. Nor had the five years of prison hell seemed to assuage any of the WAP's desire to square accounts. He had repeated his threat many times in prison, 
and he had been indifferent as to who heard him. The feud was no secret to the police. That was the gist of it. As for Ivan Barloff, Billy Kane was somewhat more precisely informed, both because the time he, Billy Kane, had spent on the East Side in carrying out David Ellsworth's philanthropies could hardly have been passed without at least a hearsay acquaintance with so well-known a character in that quarter as Ivan Barloff, and because, too, Red Vallon, in that last interview, had seemed to take a malicious delight in exploiting his own vastly more intimate knowledge of the little old Russian of many parts. On his own account he knew, naturally, only what the public knew and believed about the man. Barloff was a sort of father to the flock, a very numerous flock, of Poles and Russians of the uneducated and illiterate class. He was all things to them. He was counsellor and confidant. He was money-lender. He was entrusted with what money they had as savings for investment. He wrote their letters. He collected their rents, being a kind of owner's sub-agent, and he lived amongst them, alone, in a little old frame house that was sandwiched in among the ramshackle tenements that housed so many of his compatriots in that section. In appearance he was a very dirty and unkempt old man, and ostensibly he was as honest as he was dirty, and he was accepted, as such, by the public, police, and compatriots alike. Red Vallon, however, had thrown quite a different light on the other's character. The man possessed the craft and cunning of a devil, and a devil's inhumanity. He had fed like a leech on the guileless trust of his ignorant clientele. He had made money, a great deal of money. Thousands were stored away in his rickety old safe, that was so rickety it disarmed suspicion, and preserving his secret he patronized no bank, but covered his constantly increasing fortune with the guise of squalor and poverty, which he kept on a level scarcely, if any, above that of those he filched. The man was a miser of the most sordid and cold-blooded sort. A nickel was not too mean a thing to scheme for, if by any means he could lay his hands upon it. Also the man had other remunerative relationships, very carefully selected relationships, with others than those with whom he openly associated. To a select few of the underworld he acted at times as fence, receiving such stolen goods as he could readily dispose of among his compatriots, who, innocent of any guilty knowledge, bought the articles eagerly at a greatly reduced figure, imagining, if they stopped to imagine at all, that the articles represented unredeemed pledges on money loaned here and there by Barloff. Billy Kane's lips twisted in a thin smile there in the darkness. It was a deal such as that, so he had gleaned from Red Vallon, that had originated the feud between Ivan Barloff and the Wop. The Wop had brought some of the proceeds of one of his predatory safe-breaking raids to Barloff, and a bargain was concluded between them. But in some way that night Barloff became aware that the police had followed the Wop to his Barloff's house. Barloff was taking no chances. He promptly cleared his own skirts at the expense of five years in Sing Sing for the WAP. He scurried to the nearest police station with the stolen articles, and with unctuous righteousness explained that he was suspicious as to how the WAP had come by them, but had bought them to pull the wool over the WAP's eyes so as to enable him, Barloff, to communicate with the police, and give the police a chance to make an investigation. Barloff got away with it, and the WAP got his ride up the river. It was perhaps not unnatural that the WAP had sworn revenge and made no secret of it. Billy Kane's twisted smile deepened. It was all very simple. It involved simply the taking of a man's life, the WAP's, which was a very small matter in the eyes of that crime trust which was running rampant now through the underworld. Also, the Rat was a man of large vision. He builded ahead and waited patiently. Barloff was known by the Rat to have a great deal of money in ready cash. It would not have been a very difficult matter, perhaps, to have robbed the old Russian at any time, but there was always the certainty of an investigation as an aftermath, and investigation sometimes had a tendency to lead in awkward directions. Much better, therefore, and much safer, 
that the trend of the investigation and its limits should be fixed in advance by the rat and so they had waited for the wop to regain his freedom they had not waited five years however for the scheme probably had not occurred to the rat until perhaps a few months ago but now the wop being free at last the wop's first act of freedom was to be made to appear that of putting his oft-repeated threat into execution barloff was to be lured out of his house on some specious pretext the house would then be entered and a forged note in the wop's scrawl carefully prepared beforehand jeering in its tone and to the effect that the wop would have got barloff as well as barloff's cash if the latter had not been fortunate enough to have been out of the house at the time would be left uh, pinned say to the wall there would not be much room for investigation the wop being dead would not make any defence the wop would never be found and as the natural thing for the wop to do was to disappear after leaving his defiant message behind him who was to imagine that such disappearance was not of the wop's own free will and design the wop was the cat's paw the blackness was absolute billy kane was feeling out again with both hands he seemed to have lost in a measure even his sense of direction he was either in a very much wider passage than that through which he had entered or else the excavation around him was actually itself one of the sub-cellars if he could but get in touch of a wall again to guide him yes here it was it swerved sharply almost at right angles to the left he followed it moving slowly scarcely more than a few inches at a time it was strange how his brain worked on ceaselessly seemingly oblivious to his immediate surroundings seemingly concerned with things extraneous to his present danger and yet that was not altogether true one thing had a bearing on another and one thing led to another it was like the cogs of wheels fitting into each other as they turned around and around this tenure of the rat's roll that was no less dangerous was apposite where was the rat while he billy kane fought to free himself from the stigma of david ellsworth's murder while he fought for his own good name and his own life on that score this role of the rat while it afforded temporary sanctuary from the police forced him into perils that his lips compressed tightly he had stumbled over something soft and yielding his outstretched hand though it saved him slipped along the wall and came up against another wall again at right angles but this time where obviously the walls made a corner he stooped down and felt over the obstruction that his foot had encountered it was a man's body it moved now and writhed a little at his touch it was the wop almost certainly the wop flung into a corner out of the way like a sack of meal but the man was still alive thank god for that he had been afraid that the initiatory stage of the work might have been only too well accomplished his hands felt upward along the bound body and touched the other's face and felt the cloth gag twisted and knotted around the man's mouth his hands felt still a little higher up to the close-cropped prison hair it was the wop beyond question he took a knife from his pocket don't make a sound he breathed as he removed the gag and cut away the cords from around the other's feet and hands you're the wop aren't you the man's affirmation was almost inarticulate billy kane slipped his arms around the other's shoulders and lifted the man into a sitting posture he had a flask of brandy in his pocket brought purposely for the wop's benefit and he held the flask now to the other's lips the stimulant seemed to eject new life and strength into the man who who are you the wop asked weakly don't talk billy kane cautioned the one thing to do is to get out of here now do you think you can walk at all yes the man answered i'm i'm not as bad as all that try then said billy kane the progress was slow pitifully slow the wop despite his own assertion was both weak and cramped and at first he was almost a dead weight as he clung with an arm flung around billy kane's shoulders but gradually he appeared to get back his strength. They stopped every two or three yards, both to rest and listen. Again Billy Kane held the flask to the other's lips. Again they went on. My God, it's a black in here. 
The Wop mumbled and shivered a little. Billy Kane made no answer. He was taking care, now, not to lose touch with the walls. The ground underfoot was beginning to rise, steeply. He caught his foot and almost fell over a huddled thing on the earth. The Chinese guard. A certain murk seemed to be penetrating the blackness. He stopped again, felt out in front of him, and listened intently for a moment, and then he placed his lips to the Wop's ear. "'There's an opening here, into a coal bin,' he whispered. "'Get down on your hands and knees and crawl through. Straight across from the coal bin there's a short flight of steps up to a door that opens on the alley. We'll make a break for it now. Keep close to me, and don't make a noise. There's a cellar stairway to the room above, and the room above isn't likely to be empty. Understand?' "'Yes,' said the Wop. "'Come on, then,' said Billy Kane. He crawled through the opening with the Wop at his heels, and rose to his feet, then, gripping at the Wop's arm, he stole across the cellar, gained the steps, and an instant later stepped out into a dark and narrow alleyway. He did not pause here. He hurried the Wop down the alleyway, and halted only when within a few yards of the first intersecting street, just far enough back in the alleyway to keep well beyond the radius of light from the adjoining thoroughfare. Neither man spoke for a moment. After the silence of that death-trap behind them, the roar of an elevated train from Chatham Square nearby seemed to Billy Kane a din infernal, and greater only by a little than the rattle of wheels, the clatter of horses' hoofs, and the multitudinous noises of ordinary traffic. He could just make out the Wop's features. One side of the man's face was streaked with clotted blood-stains. But apart from that, the Wop had showed little outward evidence of the attack that had been made upon him. He stood there now, quite steady on his feet, his eyes studying Billy Kane's mask in a puzzled way. Say, said the Wop, a sudden huskiness in his voice, I owe you something. What's your name? Billy Kane shook his head. Never mind about that, he said quietly. There's something else that's of vastly greater importance so far as you are concerned. Do you know why they got after you tonight, or who it was that got you in that trap? No, said the Wop. I'll tell you then, said Billy Kane. It was because you threatened to get even with Ivan Barloff. Barloff! The Wop's fists clenched, and he stepped closer to Billy Kane. So it was a Barloff, was it? I must have had the fear of God in him, than to make him spend any money even to hire thugs. Oh, Barloff! <laughs> well, I'm a-going to see Barloff pretty soon. No, you're not, said Billy Kane crisply. That's exactly why I'm telling you this. It isn't Barloff. It's a crowd that knew of your threat and were getting after Barloff and framing you up for the job. They're planting a little evidence against you in Barloff's place in exchange for Barloff's cash. And with you finished off via the murder route, they expect the police to throw up their hands after a while and admit you've made a clean getaway with the swag. The Wop's face was close to Billy Kane's, and the Wop's face was suddenly pinched and white. He touched his lips with his tongue, and then, as suddenly, the blood flushed back, and he thrust out his under jaw truculently. They would, huh? The dirty swabs? he snarled. Who are they? I'll make em quarrel for this. Billy Kane smiled grimly. No, I guess not, he said softly. You're very much better out of it. But I promise you they'll not get away with it if you'll do what you're told now. The Wop knuckled his forehead in a perplexed way. What uh, do you want me to do? There was a lingering sullen note in the Wop's voice. Just this, said Billy Kane quietly. I want you to get out from under. You're not looking for another five years in Sing Sing, are you? The Wop flinched. He drew his knuckles again across his eyes. No, he said hoarsely. Billy Kane nodded. Quite so, he said calmly. Well, then, it is simply a question of establishing an alibi for you that will be absolutely holeproof from now until, say, midnight. Where can you go? I know... Gus Moray that the runs the Silver King Saloon, said the Wop. He, he'll swear to it, all right. Yes, whether you were there or not, said Billy Kane dryly. No, that, that's not good enough. If anything breaks wrong tonight, you've got to have something better than an alibi and a dive like that to stack up against what will look like an open and shut evidence against you. 
You've got to get on a higher plane than that. The Wop shook his head. I ain't been a very regular church attendant, he said, with a sickly grin. And uh, he stopped short and suddenly leaned toward Billy Kane. Say, would a minister do? <laughs> it would be an improvement, admitted Billy Kane with a smile. Well, I got it then, announced the Wop. His hesitancy had vanished. He seemed eager, almost anxious now. The iron of five years of prison was evidently far too poignant a memory to risk it being turned into reality again. I got it. There's a guy named Mr. Claflin that ran one of them mission joints down around the where I used to hang out before I went up. He's all right. He's the only soul on God's earth coming near me when I was doing my spaces. Twice he came up to Sing Sing to see me. He didn't hold no prayer meeting with me neither, but he's got a grip on his hand that makes a fella feel like he ain't all dirt. He's white, he is. You know where he lives? inquired Billy Kane crisply. No, said the Wop, and was suddenly downcast. And uh, he ain't at the mission any more, cause he told me he's got a regular layout up a town somewhere. No matter, said Billy Kane cheerfully. Any drugstore has a directory. You can find the address there. Got any money? The Wop felt through his pockets, and the red flared into his face again. Frisk! he flung out savagely. Billy Kane handed the other a banknote. Spend this on the first taxi you can grab, he said. You've got to get there as soon as you can, and you've got to keep under cover getting there. If Mr. Claflin is not at home, wait in his house for him. Don't let them sidetrack you, and make it a point of establishing the hour you get there, either with the minister himself or whoever happens to be at home, and stay there until midnight anyhow. Understand? Yes, said the Wop. Well, then, said Billy Kane, beat it. The Wop hesitated. Say, ain't I a going to know who you are? He blurted out. Say, I ain't anything but a crook, just a damned crook with a prison record, but, but I'd a like to pay what I owe. Ain't you going to give me the chance? Yeah, you've got it now. Billy Kane's hand went to the other's shoulder. It's a rotten road to Sing Sing. You're out of it now. Stay out of it. He gave the Wop a friendly push toward the street. We've no more time to lose. Beat it, he said, and without giving the Wop time to reply, he turned abruptly and ran back along the alleyway. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One Without Mercy. Billy Kane went on to the intersecting street at the other end of the alleyway, removed his mask, and stepped out on the sidewalk. He looked at his watch under a street lamp and smiled whimsically in surprise. It was still only half past eight. All told, he could not have been in Wong Yen's more than fifteen minutes, hardly that, in fact, and it seemed as though he had been there half the night. Well, it was Barloff's now. Barloff's was a little further uptown, a little deeper over in the east side. Billy Kane's smile, from whimsical, became tinged a little with weariness, became a little wan as he walked along. He was the victim of a plot himself that was aimed at his life, that sought to throw the guilt of a crime upon his shoulders just as the Wop was. And circumstances not only permitted, but seemed to force him constantly into these byways to save others, while he himself stood condemned in the eyes of the public as a murderer and a thief. And there was bitter irony in the thought that he could not clear his own name, that he seemed powerless to help himself, while the mantle of one of the underworld's arch-criminals, which temporarily afforded him sanctuary from the police, supplied him with almost unlimited information and the means of helping others. His brows knitted suddenly into a puzzled frown. Was that altogether true? There seemed to be a most strange coincidence in these excursions, forced or voluntary, of his into the byways of criminal things, a coincidence that always seemed in some way to link up his own plight with these other criminal schemes in which he became involved. 
there was the night that peters had been murdered for instance which had led him to the knowledge that the man with the crutch was at least a co-murderer of david ellsworth and then the attempt at blackmail of two nights ago had again disclosed the hand of the man with the crutch and more significant still had enabled him billy kane to recover the cash stolen from the library vault on the night of the ellsworth murder who was this man with the crutch this man with a crutch whose shaft was stained to resemble grained wood and so disguised the murderous iron of which it actually consisted and which he was sure now was the weapon that had brought both david ellsworth and peters to their deaths billy kane shook his head it was a curious chain of coincidence but it could be only coincidence and there was a limit to that to-night for instance it would put a pretty severe strain upon the imagination to conceive of any connection between the wop and the man with the crutch and yet he shrugged his shoulders he would have said the same thing two nights ago wouldn't he it was very strange it was all strange he seemed to be existing in a sphere of unreality there was the man with the crutch whom neither police nor underworld could find since the raid on the man's room there was the constant ominous swirl and eddy of hidden and unseen things on every hand there was the rat and there was the woman in black his face softened suddenly he had not seen her since yesterday morning when she had entered the rat's den through the secret door and he had returned to her Daler's letter. She had not been in a pleasant mood at what she believed had been his trickery, and failing to have restored that letter to her, she would have turned him, whom she, like everyone else, believed to be the rat, incontinently over to the police. What was the hold she had upon the rat? Where was she to-night? How was it that her hand had not already showed in this attempt upon the wop, since uh, she seemed to have always in her possession the details of the rat's schemes he shrugged his shoulders again what was the use to-night at least she could harbor no delusion that he was acting under any spur of hers no that wasn't it that wasn't what was troubling him what troubled him was that she should think him what he was or rather all that he was not strange that her opinion of him even when his back was against the wall and his life was literally in jeopardy at every turn should make any difference strange that the loathing and contempt in those brown eyes that were fearless and deep and steady should haunt him and add to his own abhorrence of the role he played because he must let her think him the rat well what did it matter what was she to him what was she becoming to him he laughed a little uncertainly. There was no need to answer that question, was there? Even if he could. What did anything matter unless he could clear his own name, which was now mired deeper than the rat's? He turned a corner, walked on the length of a block, and on the next corner, drawing back into a doorway out of the radius of the street lamp, paused a moment to get his bearings. He smiled a little grimly. If the affair ever came to her knowledge, would she give the rat credit this time for a spontaneous change of heart in saving the wop's life and saving Ivan Barloff's cash? <laughs> he scowled suddenly. The latter proposition did not altogether please him. Barloff was not far removed in guilt from those who proposed to victimize Barloff. There would be a certain ironical justice in robbing from Barloff the cash that Barloff had all too patiently, a great portion of it at least, robbed from others. But Red Vallon and his pack were not to get it, were they? It was the lesser evil to warn Barloff, that was all. In the main, therefore, the night's work was over, since the wop was safe, for five minutes' conversation with Barloff would end the whole affair now, so far as he, Billy Kane, was concerned. He glanced down the street. Just a little ahead on the opposite side, huddled in between two six-story tenements, was Barloff's squat, dingy little house. There was a faint glow of light, as though it came from somewhere far in the interior, showing through the single front window on the ground floor. Billy Kane considered this thoughtfully for a few seconds. Barloff was at home, evidently but the probability was that one, at least, of Red Vallon's men was on watch in front of the house. 
In fact, it wasn't probability, it was a certainty. Barloff, according to Red Vallon, was to receive a fake telephone message that would lure him out of the house, and someone undoubtedly would be waiting to report the old Russian's exit. It therefore, to say the least of it, would be, Billy Kane's smile was mirthless, unwise for the rat to walk up to Barloff's front door under the existing conditions. He might have telephoned. Well, he shook his head as he crossed the road, and keeping in the shadow, stepped into the cross street. He preferred to interview Barloff via Barloff's backyard. He was still obsessed with the desire to take personal toll from all concerned in the miserable night's work, but he realized that impulse and sane action did not always go hand in glove. He could not afford to play fast and loose with this role of the rat, or take any unnecessary risks. But he could satisfy himself, to the extent at least of a personal interview with Barloff, who was perhaps, after all, the most despicable of the lot, and put into the puny shriveled soul of the man a fear that would make for some degree of future righteousness. A lane, as he had expected, ran in the rear of the tenements and Barloff's house. Billy Kane slipped into this, located Barloff's house, low-lying against the skyline between the taller buildings, swung himself over the fence, dropped noiselessly to the ground, and for a moment stood there motionless. The yard was very small and but a few feet in front of him a light from the open and uncurtained window of Barloff's rear room streamed out across the intervening space. Voices reached him, but he could not distinguish the words. Neither from where he stood could he see anyone in the room, though the window was quite low, little more than breast-high from the ground. And then a form inside the room passed across the window space, a woman's form, and again a voice reached him a woman's voice, and Billy Kane drew in his breath sharply. He still could not distinguish the words, but he had recognized the voice. Once again he had jumped too hastily to conclusions in so far as she was concerned. It was the woman in black. There was no question as to why she was there. It was obvious that she had simply forestalled him in warning the old Russian, but a perplexed frown furrowed Billy Kane's forehead. Her hand would have showed a little late in the game to have saved the wop. He stole forward, keeping in the shadows of the side fence, reached the rear wall of the house, edged across to the side of the window where he could both see and hear, and crouched there. His eyes swept the interior in a swift, comprehensive survey. It was a sordid, ill-furnished, bare-floored room, and very dirty. A seedy old Morris chair in the center of the room supplied the only suggestion of comfort or luxury, and that an incongruous one, that the place possessed. Apart from that, there was a huge and aged safe, a relic of the days when such things were locked with keys, which was backed up against one wall. And near an open door, which apparently led into the front room, there was a battered desk with an equally battered swivel chair, and that was all unless the telephone that stood upon the desk might be included in the furnishings. There was, however, another door, also open, which faced the safe, and which apparently gave on a passageway that in turn opened on the backyard. Billy Kane glanced around him. Yes, there was a rear door here, just a little to his right. His eyes reverted to the interior of the room. She was still pacing up and down its length from the desk to the window and back again. Perhaps it was the effect of the green-shaded incandescent bulb that dangled over the desk, but as she turned facing the window, he saw that her face, drawn in sharp pinched lines, was very white, and that in the dark brown eyes, all softness gone from them now, there was a hard and bitter light. And at the desk, the old Russian, a grey-bearded and threadbare figure in dirty and grease-spotted clothes, huddled deep down in his chair, and wrung his hands together, and with little black shifty eyes that peered over the rims of steel-bowed spectacles, followed her about in a fascinated sort of way, and the while he kept circling his lips with his tongue. The wop! The wop! he shrilled out suddenly, and seemed to cower lower in his chair. Yes, yes, I am afraid. My God, I am afraid. He, he is strong. He, he would have no pity on an old man. 
he has sworn it i know i i have been afraid of this day why did they let him out <laughs> they know too and i was only honest everybody knows that he was a thief what else could an honest man do except what i did he, he would kill me and the wop is dead her voice was low bitter hard and yet too it seemed to hold impatience and irritation directed against the russian i have told you that it is not the wop you have to fear now the wop is dead but you are not sure not positive you are not absolutely positive of it barloff was wringing his hands the harder and his tones rather than being assertive seemed to be pleading for a denial i am positive enough of it she answered evenly to see that the one who is responsible pays for it tonight it is my fault her voice caught a little but hardened instantly i trusted where i was a fool to trust and i have paid for it with another's life but that has nothing to do with you you know now that the telephone message you received a little while ago was simply to lure you out of the house at half-past nine in order that they might have a clear field in which without contradiction to make it appear that the robbery they are planning was the wop's work it is scarcely nine o'clock yet you have plenty of time in which to act you can appeal to the police or billy kane was no longer paying any attention to her words tense strained he stood there he seemed to be trying to lash his brain into virility into activity he seemed to be groping out in an ineffectual mental way for some means to avert a disaster that he realized was closing down upon him she believed the wop was dead she naturally held the rat responsible and he was the rat so far as she was concerned she had warned him without mincing words that if any crime in which the rat was involved was carried through to its fulfillment she would hold him responsible and hand him over to the police she had reason to believe that he had already tried to double-cross her once she now believed that to-night he had tried to do it again she would leave here and go straight to the police the police then would not only be looking for billy kane they would be looking for the rat and they would get billy kane and that would be the end of it all the end of it when he already knew who the murderer of david ellsworth was when apart from the collection of rubies he had already recovered the proceeds of the ellsworth vault robbery when if he could only cling for a few days more to this role he played he might hope to clear his own name to stand four square with the world again and to bring to justice those who had taken old david ellsworth's life somehow in some way he must prevent her from carrying out what was now her obvious intention of unmasking the rat but he dared not show himself in front of the house to intercept her when she went out he dared not show himself as the rat out there to bring the underworld down upon him was only to invite a swifter destruction from another source he gnawed in perplexity at his lips staring into the room she kept pacing up and down barloff had risen from his seat and in a curious cringing way standing now by the rickety old safe was fondling it and patting it with his hands yes yes barloff was crooning i thank you i thank you i do not know who you are but i thank you i have not much very little very very little but i am an old man and what would become of me if i lost my little the police yes the police the old russian his back now to the window was still talking more to himself than to her she came close to the window this time and billy kane suddenly showed himself she was very clever very self-centered very sure of herself if she was startled she gave no sign of it she came still closer until she leaned for a moment against the sill out there the lane when you leave he whispered quickly she nodded her head but her lips had tightened in a forbidding little smile as she turned away again. Billy Kane drew back from the window. There was a sense of relief upon him, and also a vague, disquieting, and very much stronger sense of something else that he could not quite define, only that between them there always seemed to stand that barrier of a forbidding smile, and that cool, contemptuous light in the brown eyes that very often changed from contempt to loathing and abhorrence. He shrugged his shoulders suddenly. He was a fool, that was all. Her voice drifted out to him, dying away as he neared the fence. 
i am going now mr barloff and i should advise you not to waste any time in taking whatever precautions you intend to take you had better communicate at once with the police and billy kane swung himself over the fence and stood there waiting in the lane a minute two three passed and then he caught the sound of a light step and she stood before him in the darkness well she said curtly i am here bundy what do you want it was the rat alias bundy morgan in her eyes and it was the rat who spoke i heard you in there he said gruffly you're going to beat it for the police and wise them up about me well you want to can that stunt because i got a little explanation to make see you do not need to make any explanation she answered evenly my stupidity is at an end that enigmatic little memo of yours was a better safeguard in itself than the hiding place in which you had secreted it for i did not understand it until i saw a few lines in the paper this evening giving a short resume of the wop's somewhat unedifying career and stating that he had been released from prison i was too late to save the wop himself but was not too late to prevent you from climbing in through the window and carrying out the rest of your abominable scheme i went in there to warn barloff myself said billy kane she laughed icily do you expect me to believe that after you have murdered a man so that you could put the onus of another crime upon him this is the end tonight. i was mad to trust you at all i was madder still to give you another chance when i caught you playing a double game both with your own criminal associates and with me when you stole that letter from Taylor two nights ago she came a little closer to him both hands were tightly clenched her lips quivered a little her voice choked i did not know what it was like to feel guilty of murder to feel that one had taken another's life i know now my folly in giving you a moment's freedom has made me as guilty as you but the end has come do you understand you might put me out of the road too here in this lane but that would not change the result any you know that you know in that case the police would be after you anyway that i have taken care of that on the other hand you may run for it now and you may make a question of hours or a question of days but as soon as the police lay hands on you your career is finished there was a strange stirring within billy kane's soul she was very close to him so close that he could see the pinched haggard look in her face and see the lips quiver again and see the clenched hands rise to her eyes as though to shut out the abhorrent sight of him from her and to shut out perhaps too the pictured sight of a man murdered and for whose life she had not illogically held herself accountable her hands gripped hard hard as the mental grip in which he held himself a sudden yearning and almost uncontrollable impulse was upon him to reach out and sweep this lithe fearless little figure that had become so mysteriously a part of his life a greater part than he had ever realized before into his arms she would struggle like a wild cat and fight with every ounce of strength yes and hatred that was in her but he could hold her because he was stronger and tell her that he was not the rat and he swallowed hard and then what tell her that he was billy kane a wan smile came to his lips she would perhaps prefer the rat the rat publicly at least was known as the less infamous of the two he laughed a little harshly forget it he said roughly i played straight with you and before you go spilling any beans to the police you better get on to yourself you don't know what you're talking about i know that the wop was murdered tonight in wang yen's by you or your orders she said passionately i know that the wop is dead that is enough nix said billy kane alias bundy morgan alias the rat the wop isn't dead and he isn't in wang yen's either i pulled him out of there she stared at him coming still closer in the darkness until he could feel her breath upon his face it was a long minute before she spoke i do not believe you she said in a dead voice he shrugged his shoulders i did not expect you to the rat's tones were insolent now but you can prove it can't you the wop's safe he's at a minister's house the minister's name is claflin i don't know the address but you can easily find it it wouldn't do me any good to lie to you would it 
You can't drag me to the police by force, and whether you squeal to them in the next ten minutes or half an hour later after finding out I was lying, I'd be just as bad off, wouldn't I? She drew back, but her eyes were still fixed steadily upon him. Yes, she said. Well, demanded Billy Kane, I can find this minister's house in that half hour, I think, she said in a low voice, and the wop, if he is there. Her voice hardened. You are quite right, Bundy. It will have done you no good to have lied. I promise you that. If I do not find the WAP, the police will find you. She was gone. End of chapter 21、chapter、22 Chapter Twenty-Two of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two The Fight Billy Kane stood in the lane for a moment, staring after her through the darkness, and his lips puckered in a sort of impotent little smile. She would find the WAP, of course, and thereafter the old relationship between them would be re established, and he whirled suddenly, and in an instant was astride the top of the fence, his face set and hard, as there came, low but unmistakably from the interior of Barloff's house, the sound of blows and the rending of wood, as though a door were being violently forced. A glance showed him that the window had been closed and the shade drawn down. Barloff had evidently got that far in safeguarding himself. Only Red Valen's Apaches had struck, perhaps suspicious of her visit, without waiting for the old Russian to go out. What else could those blows mean but an attack on Barloff? Certainly Barloff must still be in there, for Barloff, warned, wasn't going out. He was going to appeal by telephone, presumably, to the police. Billy Kane's mind was racing as he whipped his mask from his pocket, adjusted it over his face, dropped to the ground, and ran across the yard. The night's work, obviously, now was far from over yet. He had yet to play, after all, that other role of his in the underworld, the man in the mask. Red Valen had said that the pigeon, French Mar, and the cadger were to carry out the robbery inside the house. That made three to one. His one chance, then, was to take them by surprise. He was working now with Whitey Jack's skeleton keys at the rear door. The cadger was an expert safe worker, just as the WAP was. And that was part of the game to make it appear to be the WAP's work. The WAP was safe now, of course, but he bit at his lips, cursing his clumsiness with the keys. Old Barloff certainly wasn't. They had intended to get Barloff out of the house. But if, without waiting for that, they struck with Barloff there, they would not stand on any more ceremony with the old man than they had with the WAP, since the WAP was to stand for it anyway. It was strange, ominously strange, that there was no outcry from Barloff. That even the sound of blows and splintering of wood had ceased. The door gave under his hand. He pushed it open cautiously, a bare half inch at a time. In front of him was a small room, obviously the kitchen, that connected with the rest of the house only by the side door of Barloff's rear room, from which the light now filtered in across the kitchen floor. He stole silently forward in the direction of the lighted doorway and halted. As a little back from the edge of the door jam, he stared in amazement into the room beyond. The door near Barloff's desk that led into the front room hung shattered on its hinges, its panels broken and splintered, but the only occupant of the room was Barloff himself. The man was standing there, a hatchet in his hand, surveying the wreckage, and mumbling inaudibly to himself. And then suddenly there came a twisted smile of comprehension to Billy Kane's lips. Old Barloff laid the hatchet down on the desk, and rubbing his hands together in a sort of fiendish exultation, a malicious grin on his cunning and crafty face, ran over to the safe and knelt before it. His mumble became quite audible now. The wop, the wop, dead, huh? And all these little rentals, these nice little rentals, just in. <laughs> And if they are stolen, eh? I am a poor man. Eh? I could not replace them. And so they would be mine. Mine. <laughs> She's sure he is dead. She said so. And I were. They have murdered him. But, but she did not see it with her own eyes. If she comes back and tells the police that. I will say that the Wap must have escaped the trap they set for him. For with my own eyes I saw him. 
and since he is dead, he will not be able to deny that. Yes, yes, Barloff, your old brain is still your best friend. And the others, ha, <laughs> ha, they have planted it on the wop. Ha, <laughs> it would be a pity to disappoint them and lose the rentals. <laughs> yes, yes, Barloff, that is so, is it not? <laughs> Certainly the wop has robbed you and tried to get revenge on you, too because you were honest enough to go to the police five years ago the man had the safe open now and was snatching books and papers from the interior and throwing them in a litter upon the floor and now he had an old tin cash box in his hands he laid this on the floor and opened it and in a sort of hideous rapacity seemed to gloat over it he dipped his hands and lifted out banknotes and let them filter through his fingers and rubbed his hands together and buried them again in the money while behind the steel bowed spectacles the little black eyes glittered with feverish exultation again, and his whole body seemed to quiver in unholy, greedy worship. Billy Kane's jaw locked hard. The man's whole life was a damnable hypocrisy, a rogue's alias. Thousands the man had somewhere, and by comparison the paltry hundreds in the cash box, if hundreds even there were, seemed to hold up as a mirror the man's soul, stripped bare until it stood out in all its naked, shriveled miserliness, its godless groveling to the only god it knew. The rentals, all the rentals, mumbled Barloff again. I am a poor man. How can I pay them over tomorrow when they have been stolen from me tonight and I have nothing left? <laughs> yes, yes, Barloff, you are getting old, but you are not yet a fool. The man was suddenly all haste. He snatched up the cash box and ran to the piece of furniture which had struck Billy Kane as so incongruous an adjunct to the furnishings of the room, the old Morris chair. He turned this over on its back. There was a faint click of a hidden spring, and the bottom underneath the seat gaped outward on what were evidently ingeniously concealed hinges. Billy Kane's eyes behind his mask narrowed in grim humor as he caught a glimpse of piles of neatly stacked banknotes in the hollow bottom of the chair. It was a sort of spacious, box-like compartment. And then the old miser had thrust in the cash box, closed the seat again, and righted the chair. Old Barloff, after all, did not place all his faith in a presumptive burglar's chivalry for the obvious helplessness of the rickety old safe. Barloff was rubbing his hands together unctuously once more, as he hurried back now to the desk. The desk was close to the already splintered door that led to the front of the house, and Barloff, catching up the hatchet in one hand, pulled the portable telephone instrument toward him with the other, and snatched the receiver from its hook. "'The police! The police! Quick! Quick!' he called into the transmitter, his voice pitched in a well-simulated scream of terror, and brought the hatchet down with a crash on the splintered panels. Billy Kane made no movement, save that his lips twitched a little. The low, cunning trickery of the man produced a sort of nauseating disgust, and, too, a sort of merciless anger. But given enough rope now, Barloff was in a fair way to hang himself, and it would afford him, Billy Kane, a very genuine pleasure to adjust, as he now proposed to do, the noose that would accomplish that hanging. Barloff was still raining his hatchet blows on the door, and then suddenly, evidently having got his connection, he was screaming again, between the blows, into the mouthpiece of the telephone. Is that the police? Yes, yes, quick! This is Ivan Barloff! Barloff, Barloff, Barloff! Yes, Barloff! Quick, help! Oh, for God's sake, help! It is the WAP! Do you hear? The WAP! Barloff slammed the receiver back on the hook and flung the hatchet down on the floor. It was quiet in the room now, except that the old man was talking again to himself in a sort of triumphant glee. Ha <laughs> ha! Got to escape from the wop now. Got to escape. Yes, yes, Barloff, you have done well. Very well. But you must hurry now. Yes, hurry. Billy Kane drew silently back into the darkness at the far side of the kitchen. There was still a little more rope left to give Barloff for Barloff's undoing. He, Billy Kane, had no intention of interfering with the hypocritical old scoundrel's self-styled escape, nor of preventing Barloff from now rushing, for instance, to the police to amplify his tale. 
but barloff to escape and carry out his ruse successfully could not rush out through the door supposedly to be barred by the wop and so reach the street that way barloff then if barloff was logical had a choice of the kitchen and the back door or the window the light in barloff's room went out billy kane smiled in satisfaction with the kitchen in complete darkness now there was no chance of his being seen if barloff came that way and no it was the window the sash creaked as the window was opened there was a low thud as the man dropped to the ground and then the sound of the other's footsteps running across the yard toward the fence billy kane laughed a little grimly under his breath as he stepped instantly forward and entered the room old barloff had just vacated it was his turn now at the telephone a hint to the police as to where the money was and with the wop's alibi thoroughly established barloff would be condemned by his own story it would require only a moment to telephone and then he would make his own getaway also it would be ten minutes at least before the police from the nearest station could answer barloff's call but if in the meantime the cadger and his pack arrived they would not only get nothing but would run a very excellent chance of being trapped by the police and billy kane with his hand groping out through the darkness for the telephone stood suddenly tense and still and then as suddenly actuated partly by some intuitive sense of danger and partly because some indefinable sound of movement caught his ear he swerved throwing his body sharply to one side there was a swish like the ugly sweep of some weapon cutting through the air from a ferocious full-arm swing a queer numbness from a glancing blow on the side of his head a crash upon the desk a metallic clatter on the floor and then he lunged forward and his hands pawing out touched and closed on a man's form in front of him billy kane's head was dizzy and swirling he was conscious that arms which were like bands of steel were around him and that his own arms to keep from being torn apart and his hold on the other loosened were straining until they hurt in their sockets it seemed as though in the pitch darkness they were reeling around the room in the crazy jerky unbalanced dance of some mad orgy a voice was snarling in his ear snarling vicious oaths snarling in a fury that seemed ungovernable beyond all license that seemed to have taken possession of the other body and soul and made the other's strength demoniacal that was it it could not be anything else that was what made the man so strong the man was mad a madman he tried to think as he gasped and panted for his breath it wasn't the cadger or french mar or the pigeon for then there would have been three of them who was it his brain was sick and swimming and refused its functions he could not think very well he must fight that was all fight it seemed to billy kane as though hours were passing it seemed as though gradually very gradually his strength was oozing away and that his hands were slipping from around the man's back he clenched his teeth together he remembered suddenly that murderous swish through the air it seemed to steady him to bring to him too a sudden fury in place of that unnerving giddiness he wanted to strike to strike as murderously as he had been struck at this thing whose hot tainted breath was on his cheek at this thing that snarled like a beast as it struggled and fought he wanted to strike only the giddiness from the blow on his head was back again and the other had wrenched himself free Billy Kane flung his weight forward to retain his hold, and with the impact both men reeled, tripped on the littered floor, lost their balance, and locked together, crashed to the ground. They rolled over once, and then the other's snarl became a vicious laugh. The giddiness was coming in quick flashes over Billy Kane now, and he felt his hands wrenched and torn away from the other, and he felt the other's body upon him now like some crushing, insupportable weight he reached out in the darkness in a desperate frantic effort to close again to protect himself from the short-armed jabs that were raining into his face his fingers touched the man's bare collarless throat slipped on the throat and suddenly held there was a string or a cord or, or something around the man's neck it was very curious but his fingers had hooked in between the cord and the flesh and he clung there tenaciously if he could only twist it and twist it hard enough he could choke the other he wasn't strong enough to do anything else just twist at the cord and choke the other and there was a sound that seemed to come from the front of the house like the opening of a door and then voices unmistakably voices but the other had heard it too 
The man was struggling now to get away, not to strike any more blows, just to wrench and tear himself loose from that cord that Billy Kane had twined around his hands and fingers. And then the cord gave with a sudden snap. The man sprang to his feet, and without a sound, like a shadowy form just visible in the darkness, flung himself out through the window. The cord was still twined around Billy Kane's fingers as he lay, half-dazed, his head swimming weakly, flat on his back on the floor. He shook it free from his hand and raised himself up into a sitting posture, as he smiled in a queer, bitter way. There was a light in the front room now, and he was too exhausted to reach the window, as his late antagonist had done, unless he stumbled and lurched there, and then he would be heard in the front room. It was the end of the Rat, alias Bundy Morgan, and it was the end of Billy Kane. It was probably the Cadger and his crowd out there, but at least they would not take him alive. His hand dove into his pocket for his automatic and encountered the brandy flask that had already stood the wop in such good stead. He snatched it from his pocket, and mask already awry on his face, carried the flask to his lips, and drank eagerly. The stimulant whipped through his veins in a fiery tide. It cleared his brain. No, it wasn't the cadger out there. The cadger and his crowd would be scared off for good now. There were two men. He could see them coming through the doorway. And he heard old Barloff's voice. He drank again greedily, shifting the flask to his left hand, while his right dove once more into his pocket and this time secured his automatic. He drew his mask back over his face. The light over the desk went on, and sitting there on the floor, Billy Kane blinked in the sudden glare at old Barloff and a police officer. "'Don't move, please, either of you, except to put your hands up,' said Billy Kane in a low voice. There was a startled exclamation from the officer, as his hands went up above his head, while a grey, blank look spread over the old miser's face, as he too obeyed with equal celerity. "'It was very curious.' Billy Kane frowned in a puzzled way. It was very curious, not so much that he should be sitting there on the littered floor with the side of his head trickling a warm flow of blood down under the neck of his shirt and holding a brandy flask in one hand and holding up two men at the point of his automatic with the other. It wasn't so much that. It was an object on the floor near the desk that looked like a round piece of grained wood, about an inch in diameter and three feet in length. He thrust the flask into his pocket, and over his mask rubbed the back of his hand across his eyes. It wasn't a vagary of his sick brain, was it? Well, he would know in a minute as soon as he lifted it and felt its weight. No, th th that wasn't necessary. He remembered that metallic clatter upon the floor. He knew what the thing was. It was the iron shaft of the crutch that he had seen two nights ago, a detachable shaft, probably, the weapon that he was satisfied had already murdered David Ellsworth and murdered Peters. His mind was clear now and working in lightning flashes. His assailant had been the one man in the world upon whose throat he had prayed to get his fingers, the man with the crutch. Well, his fingers had been there, only he had been at a disadvantage, weak and dizzy from the blow from that thing there. And yes, this was curious, too. He was watching the two men, his automatic covered them unswervingly, but out of the corner of his eye he could not help but see that red patch on the floor beside him that looked like an ordinary flannel chest protector, and to which the cord that he had torn from his antagonist's neck was still attached. He reached for it and thrust it into his pocket, as he rose slowly and a little unsteadily to his feet. He eyed the two men now for a long, calculating second. Yes, his brain was quite clear now, exhilaratingly clear. And the mental exhilaration seemed to bring in its train a new physical strength as well. In a flash he saw the way out now, and with it, too, the means of slipping Barloff's self-knotted noose around the miserly old Russian's throat. But he must work quickly. There was not an instant to spare. This officer could not have come in answer to Barloff's telephone call, for he realized that, long as it had seemed, his fight here in the room could not have lasted in reality more than two or three minutes, and it had been almost on the instant that Barloff had run from the house. There would not, therefore, have been time for the telephone call to have been answered, for the nearest police station was too far away, and besides, in that event, there would have been more than one officer. 
Barloff had probably encountered the policeman out on the street, and carrying out his devilishly inspired plan had poured his story into the officer's ears and rushed the other back to the house. But in that case the men from the station would be on their way here now and the leeway left him, Billy Kane, in which to act must even now be narrowed to the very perilous margin of but another four or five minutes, perhaps less. "'Move to the wall, face it, and keep your hands up,' ordered Billy Kane curtly. The officer, with a chagrined scowl and a shrug of his shoulders, obeyed. Barloff, white and trembling and thoroughly frightened, needed no urging. "'You've got the drop on me,' snarled the officer. "'But you don't worry, me bucko. I know who you are. "'That mask ain't doing you any good. "'There's a free ride and board coming to you again.' "'Billy Kane's automatic was pressed into the small of the officer's back. "'With his free hand he deftly relieved the other of a pair of handcuffs and a revolver. "'That's all right,' said Billy Kane coolly. "'Now, oh, Barloff, stick your right hand out behind you.' "'He slipped one of the steel cuffs over the Russian's wrist. "'Now, you, officer, know your right hand. "'I know it's customary in making an arrest to leave your right hand free, "'but in the circumstances I am forced to inconvenience you a little in your movements.' "'He snapped the other cuff shut. "'Thank you. You may both turn around now.' "'He stepped back, hurled the officer's revolver out through the window, "'and picked up the weapon whose blow, luckily for him, he had partially evaded.' He had in no way been mistaken. It was the iron shaft of the crutch, and it was ingeniously fashioned with a spring catch that obviously fitted into a socket in the now missing armpiece of the crutch. It served him now as a support. He leaned upon it, using it as a cane, as he swayed a little on his feet. "'I can only spare a moment,' he said engagingly to the officer, "'but possibly I can make that moment well worth your while. We'll talk quickly, if you please.' I imagine that you were on your beat out there on the street when Barloff here found you, am I right? Where else would I be? said the officer gruffly. That's what I wanted to make sure of, returned Billy Kane pleasantly, and that's why I want to get through here in a hurry, before your reinforcements arrive. What story did this man tell you? Say, said the officer shortly, you've got your nerve with you, but you can't get away with it. I tell you, I know you. "'You might as well take that mask off. You're the wop.' "'You're jumping at conclusions,' said Billy Kane calmly. "'Because Barloff here has told you the wop had broken in and robbed him. "'Well, ask Barloff, then.' He turned on Barloff. "'I'm not the wop, am I, Barloff?' The old man shook his head. "'No, you're not.' Barloff swallowed hard. He was evidently floundering in a perplexed mental maze. "'But my money's gone, and the wop was here. I saw him. I saw him. Maybe you're a pal of his.' "'I am for tonight,' said Billy Kane quietly. "'When did you see the wop? What did you tell this officer here?' "'Oh, you are, are you?' Barloff seemed suddenly relieved. He shook his free fist at Billy Kane. "'So you're a pal of the wops, are you? Well, I don't know where you came from, but I saw the wop just as plainly as I see you now.' He edged around and addressed the officer eagerly. "'I was sitting at the desk there, officer, just as I told you, and that door was open, and there was a, a light in that front room. The, the wop must have got the front door open without my hearing him. I, I saw him stealing across the room out there. I, I rushed to the door and shut it and called for help. He began to smash it in, and I, I grabbed up the telephone and called the police, and then ran for the window and got out by the lane to the street where I found you.' He would have killed me. He swore he would when he went to prison. His voice changed suddenly into a whining wail. He's got my money. Look at the floor. Look at the safe. He's got my money. I ran with it when he heard us coming. He began to claw frantically at the officer's sleeve. The wops got it. Look, officer, this pal of his has been hurt. Look at the side of his head. That's why he didn't get away, too. That's why we found him here on the floor. You talk as though you'd been frisked of a million. Billy Kane was tauntingly sarcastic now. How much did you have, anyway? How much? How much? Howled Barloff. Enough to ruin me. All this month's rentals that I had just collected. 
three hundred and eighty seven dollars three heaven and eighty seven dollars billy kane mimicked the other admirably you don't mean to say you'd keep three hundred and eighty seven dollars that crazy old safe that's fallen to pieces do you where else would i keep it barloff was shaking his fist again yes i kept it there and that's where it was tonight and it's gone now gone is that all you had billy kane's sneer was irritatingly contemptuous oh shrieked barloff oh yes all of it but it is enough i am a poor man and the money was not mine and i cannot replace it and <laughs> he choked suddenly and shrank back dragging the officer with him a step billy kane had moved abruptly to the morris chair and uh, toppled it over on the floor you pitiful liar you haven't seen the wop in five years rasped billy kane and the iron shaft in his hand crashed through the false bottom of the chair a package of banknotes tumbled out on the floor another and yet another a second blow dislodged the cash box and a further rain of banknotes you thought the wop was dead and that you could make him stand for this did you rasped billy kane again you yellow cur so that you could steal those few miserable rentals yourself my god gasped the officer barloff was a groveling thing at his side he jerked the other toward him and stared into the white working features billy kane back to the window and there was an abrupt change in his voice as he addressed the officer i'm going now he said softly i am not quite sure of the technical charge against your prisoner but i imagine it is just plain theft of three hundred and eighty seven dollars and it might be interesting too to know where so poor a man got that small fortune there on the floor perhaps barloff will tell you as for the wop he has never been near this place and you will find him at the reverend mr claflin's house where he's been all evening i think that's all officer except billy kane had straddled the window-sill except that i apologize to you for anything in the shape of les majesty of which i may have been guilty but as i have certain personal reasons that justify me in not desiring to appear publicly in the matter i am sure you will admit i had no other billy kane did not finish his sentence he dropped hurriedly to the ground and ran or rather half ran half stumbled his way to the fence and lane someone was at the front door again obviously the police detail from the station he made his way along the lane and from that lane into another he was still weak and progress was slow and for half an hour he kept under cover when he finally emerged into the open he was blocks away from barloff's house and very much closer to a certain temporary sanctuary in the heart of the underworld ten minutes later behind locked doors he was sitting at the dilapidated table under the single incandescent light in the rat's den before him lay a small red flannel sack that might have passed as an ordinary chest protector and which he had cut open with his knife he raised his hand and passed it across his eyes the wop and barloff were extraneous considerations now there was something far more vital to think about but his brain was refusing its functions again he was very tired very tired and weak there was the man with the crutch the man who he knew now had killed peters and david ellsworth the man who had looted david ellsworth's vault of its money and its priceless rubies the man for whose guilt he, Billy Kane, was held accountable, the man with whom he had fought tonight. In a numbed way, and because his mind was in a sort of torpor, Billy Kane was dimly conscious that there was no more any mere coincidence in this repeated appearance of the man with the crutch. He knew now that Jackson, the footman, had only been an underling. It was curious, singular, sinister. Who was the man? What did it mean? The man wasn't even lame, was he? He remembered the extraordinary agility the other had showed two nights ago. And why was the shaft of the crutch detachable? And the man hadn't fought like a crippled man tonight, and there had been no sign of the upper portion of the crutch either. Billy Kane's head sank forward a little on his shoulders. He raised himself with a jerk and stared at the red flannel sack in front of him. A score of magnificent rubies scintillated in fiery flashes under the light 
"'They're not all here,' mumbled Billy Kane with a twisted smile. "'They're not all here. Not yet.' End of chapter 22「Twenty Three of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three The Rendezvous. It was night again in the underworld. Billy Kane slipped suddenly into the dark shadows of a doorway. Fifty yards ahead of him, up the poorly lighted, narrow, and miserable street, three men had paused on the sidewalk and were engaged in what was apparently an animated discussion. Billy Kane's eyes narrowed in a puzzled, perturbed, and yet grim way as he watched them. He had followed them for an hour now, from a saloon where he had found them to a disreputable pool room, and from there again to a saloon, and now here. He did not understand. It was one of those strange portals, so extraneous to the aim of clearing his name of the murder of David Ellsworth, and yet to so essentially a corollary of the rat's role that he played here in the underworld, at which he was knocking again. His lips curled in a queer smile. How long would it be before the end? And what would that end be? In his possession now, save for a portion of the rubies, perhaps half of them, was everything that the murderers of David Ellsworth had stolen from the old philanthropist's vault on that night which seemed now to belong to some past age and incarnation. He knew now that the man with the crutch was an actual murderer. But there he faced a blank wall. He had even fought with the man in the blackness of old Barloff's room last night, not knowing until too late who his assailant was, and the man had got away. His hand at his side clenched. It could not endure very long this impossible situation in which he found himself with that strange unknown woman who, believing him to be the rat, held the threat of Sing Sing over his head. And there was the rat himself, whose name and personality and home, such as it was, he had usurped during the latter's absence, an absence that might terminate at any moment. And there were the police who dragged the city and the country from end to end for Billy Kane. From any one of these three sources, swift as a lightning stroke, without an instant's warning, the end might come with that goal of life still unreached, and, greater than life, his honor still unreclaimed. And it seemed tonight, somehow, that his chances were bitterly small, that somehow the odds seemed to be growing and accumulating against him. He was on another errand now, because he could not help himself. He was allowing precious moments that should have been devoted to the one chance he had, that of searching ceaselessly, pitilessly, remorselessly for the man with the crutch, to be directed into other channels, because he could not help himself. He stepped out from the shelter of the doorway and started forward again along the street. The three men had turned from the sidewalk and had disappeared inside a dingy, black, and tumble-down tenement. Billy Kane's lips tightened a little. It was a hard neighborhood nestling just off the Bowery, as hard almost as the three characters themselves who had just vanished from sight. There were a few pedestrians here on the side street, a few figures that skulked along in the semi-darkness rather than walked, but not many. And for the most part, though it was still early, not more than nine o'clock, the buildings that planked the street were dark and unlighted. Billy Kane jerked his slouch hat farther down over his eyes as he walked along. He did not understand. Two hours ago he had been sitting in the rat's den with Whitey Jack, who had ventured out of hiding again, safe now, since the interest of the police in Peter's, the butler's, murder, had become definitely centered in the man with the crutch. And someone had knocked at the door. Whitey Jack had answered the knock and had brought back the message that Bundy Morgan was wanted at the telephone in the little shop across the street. He, Billy Kane, in his role of the rat, alias the said Bundy Morgan, had perforce answered, and as he had picked up the receiver, he had instantly recognized the voice of the woman whom he knew by no other name than the one he himself had given her, the woman in black. He was subconsciously rehearsing the rather one-sided conversation now as he moved along. "'Is that you, Bundy?' she had asked. "'And do you know who is speaking?' 
Yes, he had answered. Listen, then. Her voice had been quiet, deliberate, and yet pregnant with a curiously sharp imperative command. Find Clarky Munn and Gypsy Joe at once, and shadow them tonight. Do not let them out of your sight, and see that you do not fail. Do you understand? Yes, he had replied mechanically, but... That was all. She had hung up the receiver at the other end of the line. He had heard of Clarky Munn and Gypsy Joe in the days when he had frequented the Badlands on old David Ellsworth's philanthropic missions, for the very simple reason that they were notorious and outstanding criminal characters, even in the heart and center of the worst crime and vice in the city. They were both lags, both men with prison records and marked by the police, also, they were versatile. They had in turn been Apaches, gangsters, box workers, poke getters, and second story sneaks, and they were credited with measuring human life purely as a commercial commodity, worth merely what they could get for it. He had heard of Clarky e. Munn and Gypsy Joe, who hadn't, but as to their lair or where they were to be found, he had not the slightest inkling. Whitey Jack, however, had solved that problem for him. He had sent Whitey Jack out to run them down, and Whitey had returned within an hour with the report that they were in a certain far-from-reputable saloon, and that they had been joined by the Cherub. He, Billy Kane, had never heard of the Cherub, but an adroit leading question or two had set Whitey Jack's glib tongue in motion. The Cherub had proved a topic that had aroused an unbounded enthusiasm in Whitey Jack, they ain't got nothing on the cherub. None of em has, Whitey Jack had asserted, switching his cigarette butt from one corner of his mouth to the other in order to permit of an admiring grin. He's the angel kid, he is. You should think he spent his life handing around hymn books and leading the singing down at the mission joints. Only he don't. If he if he got enough for it, he'd, he'd pull a gun and blow your bean off, and, and you wouldn't believe it was him even while he was doing it. He's looked that innocent. Believe me, Bundy, he's got them all skinned, and he ain't got no limit except the sky. Maybe someday the police will get wise, but they ain't fallen to the sweet little face of him with his baby eyes yet. <laughs> but ah, what's the use? You know him as well as I do. You should think they'd just lifted him out of a dinky little cradle and soused them all over with Florida water. That's the cherub. <laughs> But the guy that knows him ducks his nut, that's all. Billy Kane shook his head in a sort of savage perplexity. He had dismissed Whitey Jack then, picked up Clarky Munn, Gypsy Joe, and the Cherub, and had followed them here. He had come abreast of the tenement in which they had disappeared now, and he looked quickly around him. There was no one on the street close enough to pay any particular attention to his movements, and there was no doorbell to ring, for in that locality the formality of entering a tenement where humans hived instead of lived, and where at all hours the occupants came and went as a matter of course, consisted in pushing the door open without further ceremony. His hand slipped into the side pocket of his coat, and his fingers closed in a reassuring touch upon his automatic. For what particular reason he was to watch Gypsy Joe and Clarky Munn, he was as much as ever in the dark, but one thing was clear. There was only one way to keep in touch with his quarry. He stepped from the sidewalk and, with well-simulated unconcern, pushed the tenement door open, entered, closed the door softly behind him, and stood there listening intently. The place was gloomy and dark and heavy with a musty, unsavory odor of garlic and rank, stale tobacco. But ahead of him, along what seemed like a narrow passage flanking the stairs, a faint glow of light struggled out into the blackness, as though from a partially open door, and from this direction a murmur of men's voices reached him. He moved stealthily forward for a few steps, and then halted abruptly, and pressed back against the wall. Yes, here were the men he sought. Insofar as locating them in the tenement was concerned, he was in luck. The hallway had widened out beyond the staircase, and from where he now stood, through a half-open door, a door that was in poverty-stricken and disreputable repair, whose panels, smashed and broken probably in some fracas of former days, 
was patched with strips of cardboard that, in turn, hanging by a tack or two, gaped blatantly. He could make out Clarky Munn's dark, scowling, unshaven features as the man sat sprawled out on a chair in the center of the room. Also, Clarky Munn was swearing viciously. Well, where's Shaky Liz, huh? Where's Shaky Liz? Who's right now about coming back here? Her tongue's been hanging out for a drink now for two weeks and she bust loose. That's what she done. Yeah, and she probably queered the whole leg, too. I told you so. I told you, you should have to show me about Shaky Liz before I go to limit. See, I ain't for any juice chair up the river, not yet, savvy? Oh, shut up. The words were clipped off. The voice was almost a boyish treble. Can your crooking. Clarky, you give me a pain. You came here because I said so, that's why. I had to steer clear of shaky Liz while she put the stunt across, and we got to know now if the girl fell for it all right. Yes, growled Clarky Munn, and shaky Liz has gone and got drunk and spilled the beans. I know her. If she has, purred the other, and there was something of finality made the more horrible by the boyish tones. She gets hers instead of the other, that's all. And anyways, yous have no kick coming. Yous and Gypsy here and me and Shaky Liz has all got a century apiece to start with. We can't lose, can we? Sure we can, complained Clarky Munn. We can lose the other 200 that's coming when the job's done, can't we? Another voice spoke in a curiously meditative, raucous way. I never thought I'd be working for him. He handed me one once that I ain't forgot. But there ain't no one dares to touch him now. He's too big. You should get Schmidt off the map. He's got the coin, but he's no good anywhere else except that he's sharper in hell. Do you remember the roll he coughs up when he peels us them century notes that night? Well, say, I guess he packs that along with him all the time. Say, I wish we had him with the girl tonight. I guess we'd get our two hundred apiece all right, all right. Clarky Munn sat suddenly bolt upright in his chair, staring across the room, obviously at the last speaker. I'd be with you, Gypsy, he said eagerly. Him and me don't belong in the same lodge neither. You know, we're all right, we are, for dirty work. That's where we stand. But where do we ever get a look in where there's something juicy going? But you should have to know he had the roll on him. You should, wouldn't get anywhere unless you did. I'd be with you, Gypsy. I wish something like that would break loose. He swung around in his chair. Hey, Cherub. Yous give me a pain murmured the boyish voice. When yous gets a chance to get that guy, yous will get a chance to hang your hat in a bathroom suite in the swellest joint in town, and use a limousine for a gape wagon, and wear spats and yellow gloves in summertime. Can to wish stuff. Billy Kane, hugging close against the wall, moved silently farther on toward the rear of the hall, until he was beyond the radius of light from the doorway of the room. The street door had opened, and a footstep, hesitant, shuffling, was out there somewhere behind him. The step came nearer, and now he could make out a woman's form that, either in reality or as an illusion due to the uncertain light, seemed to sway a little unsteadily as she walked. Opposite the door she stood still, and now in the fuller light Billy Kane could see her quite distinctly. Obviously it was the woman they had referred to as Shaky Liz, an old, unkempt, hag-like creature who blinked sore red-rimmed eyes in apparent astonishment and consequent indecision at the partially open door and the light from within. And then she stepped forward into the room, and the next moment the door closed with a slam behind her, and with the slam her voice rose in a curious gurgling cry that seemed to mingle terror and an unbridled fury. In an instant Billy Kane had retraced his steps and was crouching against the closed door. He could see now even better than before. The gaping strip of cardboard that did duty for the smashed panel, dislodged still further by the violent slam of the door, afforded him an almost unrestricted view of the interior. Clarky Munn had not moved from his chair, 
and a little way from him, legs swinging from a dilapidated, rickety table, Gypsy Joe, black-visaged and swarthy, sucked indifferently at a cigarette. But over in the far corner of the room, by the bed, the woman, her hat knocked to the floor, her tangled gray hair draggling about her eyes, was engaged in a violent struggle with a small boyish figure who had her by the throat and was shaking her head savagely back and forth. Billy Kane drew in his breath. He remembered Whitey Jack's description of the cherub in action, and it was literally true. The blue eyes were bland and round and seemed to smile. The young face was the face of a guileless youth in repose, and yet the boy, he couldn't be much more than a boy, was in a passion worthy of an incarnate fiend. "'Yous have been out hitting the can, have yous?' snarled the cherub. "'I'll teach yous. Just think I spent two weeks hanging around this dirty hole of yours and standing for yous being me sick disabled grandmother, with me supposing to be doing my best to keep bread in your mouth and playing poor and having to listen to her trying to get me jobs and handing me the soft goody-goody talk. D'ye think I'm standing for that just to have yous go out and kick the stuffing out of the whole lay? I'll teach yous. It's a lie, screamed Shaky Liz. She shook herself suddenly free and with crooked fingers clawed like a wild cat at the cherub's face. I didn't grab no game. It's a lie. I got it all, all fixed up before I went out. I guess I got a right to a drink now, ain't I? The cherub warded off her attack with a vicious sweep of his fist. Yes, he snarled again. And suppose she'd seen us, or suppose she'd come back here by any chance and found a poor bedridden grandma gone out for a drink. Ah, blast you! Couldn't just wait a few hours more. The whole outfit'd be glad if you had drunk yourself to death then. Shaky Liz dashed the hair out of her eyes and swept her hands in a half angry, half expostulating gesture toward the others. I didn't queer no game, she insisted truculently. I guess I know what I'm doing, and you ain't coming in here to pull no rough house business either. Oh, I let her alone and give her a chance to tell her story, drawled Gypsy Joe from the table. We ain't got all night to stay here. Sure, said the cherub softly and smiled beneficently as he sat down on the edge of the bed and calmly lighted a cigarette. Go on, Liz, spill it. The old hag stared at him for a moment in silence as she dug again at her disheveled locks. You jay little runt, she found her voice at last, and in spite of her scowl, there was a grudging note of admiration in her tones. You're pretty slick, ain't you? Sure, admitted the cherub imperturbably. If I wasn't, just wouldn't have a hundred dollars in your kick now and two hundred more coming tomorrow. If you ain't queered it for yourself, go on, give us the dope. Shaky Liz preened herself. She adjusted the threadbare bodice of her dress that seemed to bulge and sag uncomfortably, picked up her hat, and smirked at her audience. It's all right, she wagged her head secretively. Yes, don't any of you need to worry. When the cherub pipes me off this afternoon that the stunt is to be pulled tonight, I sends for her as soon as he gets out of the way, and she comes on the run. She don't suspect nothing, cause with two weeks' acquaintance she can that, interrupted the cherub politely. We all knows that for two weeks you and me have been getting acquainted with her and feeding her on jellies, and that I'm the errand child that's taken a shine to her, and that maybe can be influenced for good if she tried hard enough. What'd she say when she comes here this evening? What did she say? repeated Shaky Liz with a sudden and malicious grin. <laughs> she falls for it, of course. What do you expect? Me, I, I was lying there on the bed when she blows in. She asks me how I was, and I says, I ain't no worse than usual, but that it's me young grandson that's traveling me, and now I ain't got no one to sell it to except her, and how uh, I don't know it, I durst tell even her. And, and then she says I oughter 
know well enough that I can trust her and, and that she won't, won't say nothing. And, and then I give her the spiel. I says I ain't slept all the last night thinking about it. I tells her it wouldn't do no good me talking to you because I ain't got any influence with you and she has. And besides that, I was afraid of Gypsy and Clarky if they got wise to me. And I tells her what a good boy you are too, Cherub, and how, though maybe you might be better, it ain't all your fault, cause you is easily led by bad company. But that you have stood by your old grandmother, Savvy. The one bright spot in me life, said the Cherub sweetly, is that my own grandmother is dead and don't know the raw deal I'm handing her. She looked just like yous, too. Not. Shaky Liz scowled. Yous close your face, she flung out. I tells her that me grandson had got pulled in by two of the toughest crooks in New York. Shaky Liz's scowl became a grin. That's yous, Clarky, and yous, Gypsy. I tells her who yous are and that last night yous three was here. And that just all thought I was asleep, but that I heard just whispering together, and that Clarky and Gypsy was persuading me little boy to pull a trick down a Kegler's dock on the East River, cause they didn't dare do it themselves on account of the police being leery about them ever since they comes down from Sing Sing the last time. <laughs> I tells her how I hear you two crooks explaining that Kegler's got a bunch of coin in his safe to pay off some sand barges that he had expected yesterday, but uh, that they got held up down the sound, and that instead of taking the money back to the bank, he was letting it rust in his box, knowing that the barges would be along the day after tomorrow, and that you said the combination of the safe and the key to the front door, and that there wouldn't be nobody around there, and that uh, anyway nobody'd suspect me, little lad, and that he was to go down there alone at ten o'clock tonight and make the hall, and then meet Clarky and Gypsy up down somewhere for the split. Gypsy Joe on the table circled his lips approvingly with the tip of his tongue. That's the stuff, Shaky, he commended. Don't use mind these guys. They ain't neither of them got nothing on yous. I'm for you, old gal. Shaky Liz grinned complacently. Me, I was I was crying good and hard by this time. She said and grinned again. <laughs> she had a face that white she'd think she was gonna pull the faint act. <laughs> I says I ain't slept all the last night trying to think what to do. And that's why I sent for her. And she asked me if I'm sure the boy was going to do it. And I says I am. And she asks me where he is. And I says I don't know. And that I don't know where to find him. That he went out just before I sent for her. And that he says he won't be back till late tonight. And that's what makes me sure he's going to do it. Sure, I was crying good and hard then, Savvy. And, and I says, he's a good boy. And if I tells the police, that'll finish him. And I says, I'm sick and I can't walk and can't go down there myself. And that she's the only one I dare trust. And besides that, she's got a lot of influence with the boy. And that I know she can persuade him not to fall for it and then nobody will know anything about it. And she says, yes, of course, I'll do anything, but where is he? Where can I find him? And I says, there uh, ain't only one place I knows, and that's down to Kegler's, and that he'll be all alone there, and that if she gets there before 10 o'clock, she'll be in time to try and stop him. And she bends over me and pats me hands. She does it. And she says, don't you worry, Mrs. Cox. She says, I'll go. And I says, 
and just won't tell nobody nor take nobody down there so nobody know about me little lad's disgrace and she says no i'll go alone and i'm sure i can promise you it'll be all right and then she goes away that's all shaky liz was fumbling with the bodice of her dress again and suddenly pulled out a black square-faced bottle that's all <laughs> she announced with a cackle and i guess i got a right to this if i wants it ain't i you can bet your life you have agreed gypsy joe with fervent heartiness and reached for the bottle in a flash the cherub was up from the bed and between them nix on that gypsy he said sharply shaky's end is all right i guess but we ain't through yet nix on that get me he stepped closer to both Clarky Munn and Gypsy Joe. Now then, he said briskly, since we've finished with Shaky, we'll get down to tax, huh? Everybody makes sure they knows their own play, and we don't do no renigs. I goes down there and use two her trailing out of sight behind, and she buttonholes me, and I gets her inside without yous if I can. But anyway, we gets her inside without any noise, and the trap door where they shoots the sweepings from the warehouse into the water under the dock does the trick. If there's enough weight on her, she'll be there forever. And there's one more thing. Nick's on the easy-fingered stuff with any safe business or anything loose lying around that looks like meat. Savvy? Tomorrow morning the place looks like it did when they left it tonight. The girls disappeared, that's all. And there's nothing to show that Kegler's doc had anything to do with it. Get me? They'll never find her. And that's what's wanted. And why we're getting two hundred apiece more. Gypsy Joe removed the cigarette from his mouth, watched the blue spiral of smoke from its tip curl upward for a moment, and pursed his lips in a ruminative pucker. I wonder what the rat had in it for her for as hard as that, he said with a shrug of his shoulders. She must have... The rat? She? The girl they were talking about? The room suddenly seemed to swirl before Billy Kane's eyes, the figures inside to become but blurred jerky objects, and then it was black around him. Automatically he was stepping backward with a cat-like tread. Automatically he was feeling his way along the black hallway. And then the cool evening air fanned his face, and he was in the street. End of chapter 23